Hello and welcome to our cloud security webinar. Today we have put together a world-class panel of experts to talk through the challenging security environment post-COVID. We also wanted to remind everyone that by signing up for this webinar, Archon will perform a no-charge security posture scan. For those who have just joined us, please feel free to take a minute and answer the poll questions located on the side of the screen. If you have any questions for our panelists throughout the presentation, please use the chat feature located on the top right of your screen. Your questions will remain anonymous. After the presentation, our panelists will go through and answer any questions that were submitted into the chat. We'll give one more minute for those who are just joining the room and then we will begin. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to talk about cloud security. We've been blessed by having a, a talented group of panelists here today to, to talk through um, the complexities of this topic. Uh, I want to start off with Chris Hankey. Tell us, tell us uh, what you do for Archon, Chris, and tell us a little bit about uh, where you came from before that gave you gave you insight into security and good question. And How long are we doing this webinar, <laughs> Jeff? So it might take a while, but no. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, pretty much, you know, Chief Information Security Officer here at Archon. I've been here for about three years. Before that, I was you know sitting on the other side of the table for quite a while. Uh, started off at Arthur Anderson, dealing with firmwide security, and then moving in when Anderson went down, went to Marsha McLennan, started getting into I, when risk was coming about, especially in the insurance world. So I was doing risk consulting, then was at Zurich Insurance, and then headed up security at United Airlines, Ace Hardware, and Cotty and Butler. And uh, but looking forward to our conversation today. All right, thank, thanks, Chris. David, David Wright, tell us a, a little bit about where you came from and what, what do you do at Archon? <laughs> Great question, I'm still trying to figure that out, Jeff. <laughs> uh, good morning, uh, my name is uh, David Wright. I head up services here for Archon. Prior to that, I was uh, responsible for infrastructure um, and the go-to-market strategy for cloud at Pacific Gas Electric, where we took uh, one of the largest utilities in the nation through a cloud journey. Um, and obviously, anybody that has anything about security is critical infrastructure, which uh, gas and uh, electric uh, utilities uh, understand very well. So, and some complexity around compliance. And some compli a lot of complexity around compliance. So, so happy to be here, and thanks for your time today. Great, uh, Tony. It's been a while. It's good to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, tell tell us a little bit about kind of what you're doing right now and and what what you're working on. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, Tony Sabai. Um, Work for Checkpoint Software Technologies. Um, uh, I'm a uh, security engineer uh, working mainly with our partners in developing uh, solutions to bring to market to our joint customers. Um, been working in the industry for a very long time. Um, different waistline and hairline ago, I started my career <laughs> sitting next to Mr. Chris Hinkey at Arthur Anderson. Oh, that's right. We're back. We're back. We're back. We're back. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, went on to a startup that was doing managed security services for organizations in the Midwest, uh, which eventually got sold to some other larger companies. Uh, did some security consulting for uh, uh, a year or so, and then I've been at Checkpoint for uh, the better part of the last couple of decades, doing a variety of roles and, and really seeing the security industry itself uh, mature and expand and become the world become a much more scarier place from a security perspective. Yeah, it, it, it is amazing. Just when we think we're turning the corner, yeah. it, it gets more frightening. So what we're gonna talk about today, um, I just wanna have a general open discussion. Feel free to jump in. I want this to be an organic discussion around, you know, the journey to the cloud, right? So the cloud, there's a lot of questions around really what does cloud security mean, but I really wanna start off with, uh, what happened over the last year and, and what we saw, because I think all of our plans to go to the cloud got supercharged um, and some dramatic things happen. I, I'm just curious, we talk all the time here, I, I'm curious from your viewpoint, you know, what happened right when COVID broke out and, and how did that change people's approach to the cloud? Yeah, I definitely think two major things happened when uh, COVID hit and obviously organizations had to shift to working more remotely, not having access to their own data centers and necessarily applications. So there was a, a big push towards newer remote access technologies, not the traditional, you know, VPN to a corporate data center and, and, and moving out from there. Uh, 
and applications moving to the cloud, whether it be SaaS-based services or whether they be applications now being hosted in a public or private cloud that's semi-controlled by the organization, completely changed organization's access to moving to more cloud-based VPNs and cloud-based access to applications. And it's really pushed the security out closer to the endpoints and the applications. And a lot of organizations have lost the control, the visibility, and the inspection points of bringing everything into a central locations for security. The, the push to those was needed to keep the businesses running and to keep organizations efficient. Some of it was done without necessarily taking in all the security concerns. And I think now that we've been in this mode of operation now for a year or so, um, organizations are now taking a step back saying, okay, what is the security of all this new stuff I had to roll out to keep my business going? What is my security exposure? What are my attack vectors? And we're really seeing organizations start to take a serious look at securing a lot of the stuff that they had to sort of rush to production or rush to market to keep their organizations busy. And that's that's what we're spending a lot of time on with our, with our partners and our customers is, is really helping people understand what security exposure they now have as they as they rush to push out a lot of this new style of connectivity and application publishing yeah right and, and to add to that you know i think emphasize what tony was saying is you know with covid everybody's now working from home that data center used to be that center of your security your applications and everything and now when you're at home how do you get those security controls closer to the users right and it's just you're you're missing that stack that you're you know used to be protecting you and now it's now trying to scramble and figure that out and get back to uh, you know a secure state for them while they're sitting at home and not in their usual place. And the good thing is, is I think everybody in the security industry foresaw us moving to this type of access and application delivery. Uh, I don't think anybody expected it to happen. You know, the catalyst of of having COVID nineteen force us to do it much quicker than I think a lot of organizations were ready for. The good thing is that the tools and the frameworks to secure this exist. So it's just a matter of now going back and actually implementing these in, in a much more secure fashion or putting security controls around things that are already implemented. So it's not like this was something that you know wasn't foresaw. It just happened a lot faster than I think all of us. Well, those 18-month 18 18 plans are now two month plans right. or one month or two days because it, it, you know, it was hurry up and get it done. Why is everybody caught off guard? What, what was the driver behind that? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of elements and if you really step back around the actual journey to the cloud, it, there's a lot of ability to be able to you know, play with sandboxes and environments that make the environment you know, very attractive. However, if you actually step back and look at a more methodical approach to go into the cloud, there's really a step-by-step -step component, much like you would build an environment out. You're looking at Things like your, what is your taxonomy of your accounts and subscriptions, an example, right? And that's more of your overlay to what your business should look like when you go out there. What are the governance mechanisms you want to put in place? How do you manage the financials? Uh, we're operating in the cloud, right, at full scale. It's a, it's a cultural shift from a work management perspective. You know, the way the IT traditionally manages your environment today is not how you manage it in the environment. And the biggest part of that today, even with security, when you're embedding security in, in whether it's in your application code or whether it's in your infrastructure deployments, in traditional IT infrastructures, it's typically an afterthought. It's a, you get the environment up, and then you think about bolting on your appliance, uh, your security appliances and your security controls and, and procedures after the fact. In the cloud, doing that, the, the, the train has already ran and left the station. And now what you're trying to do is, not only are you trying to replicate legacy technology processes and controls, you're now doing it at a very metered space. So what you were able to maybe catch up over a three, four month period traditionally on-premise is now ran away from you in the cloud because you're just doing it that much faster. Um, so organizations taking that typical infrastructure as a service approach, right, they realize very quickly that, oh, all those legacy controls, I have to now replicate them in that environment because I'm not taking advantage of, let's call them the native services, or I'm not embedding security as part of my default build, right, or whatever I do. And so I think the I think the, the fear or what's caught them behind is saying, oh, wow, I used to have three to four months to catch this stuff up. You know, maybe the CISO would catch us in a compliance and audit. Now they don't. They're being surprised, you know, immediately. And, and one thing to take away from this is there's, a, there's a, a, 
uh, somewhat a default assumption that you know these commercial cloud providers already have you covered. Well, their responsibility is the security of the cloud. Companies and the individuals that use them, they're responsible for the security in the cloud. And there's a nuance there, yeah. right? Amazon, Google's, and you know Microsoft are providing you this very bright red line around their boundary. But the minute you poke a hole in that, um, all of a sudden that you know the bright red red lines kind of go away. So anyway, there's a. So I think that's some of the subtleties around ensuring that you have a good methodical approach, or very quickly after you've gone to the cloud, ensuring that you backtrace and ensuring that you're doing some of those fundamentals. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and over the last couple of years, and obviously greatly accelerated during the COVID you know, uh, time, and, and we're still in it, is a lot of the incidents that we're working with our, our, our customers on um, are a lot related to people moving to the cloud and not doing some of the simple things. So it's, it's not as complex as it may seem. It's, it's creating workloads or, or storage buckets or or storage arrays, depending on which cloud you're using and, 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 and what names they call them, and not doing the simple things of securing those assets you're putting into the cloud to the point you made of the the cloud providers are responsible for the security of the cloud. Yeah. They're, if no one's going to, Microsoft is assuring their, in their best way possible that no one's going to hack Microsoft and get in through the back door. But once you create something in the cloud and you start opening up access to it, it is now your responsibility to protect the assets that you're now exposing to the outside world or even inside your own organization. And there's native tools within the cloud providers to help you do that. And there's obviously third party tools that work with those native tools to, to help you do that. But it's still your responsibility to make sure that stuff is implemented. It's not Microsoft's or Amazon or Google or you know IBM or Alibaba's responsibility to make sure you're using their tools or third party tools to secure the stuff you're putting out there. So it's real simple things like not exposing your 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 storage. You look at the you know the Capital One breach um, that everybody's heard about. Yeah. Um, it was because they had storage buckets in Amazon that were unencrypted and not protected. It's very easy to say, oh, I've got a S3 bucket in Amazon and this application's putting data in it. And it's very easy to just open it up to the internet and you have no idea unless you're specifically looking for it or have tools that are specifically looking for that governance and compliance that, that, that you mentioned. If you look at different studies, uh, you know, either by you know, FBI or you know, even third parties, they all pretty much agree that about between 85 and 95% of all security breaches in the cloud were caused by human error really misconfigurations and not simple misconfigurations simple misconfigurations yeah. it wasn't some complex state acting hacking you know uh, crazy group that was exploiting some zero day vulnerability right. which is still a problem it is just people not following best practices not looking at their environment not having the visibility that they once had when they had a data center that was contained within four walls that they could say, oh, yeah. I know what that thing does because I bought it and I'm depreciating it and I have it you know, as an accounting record. In the cloud, I can bring things up and down. A, a, a service may only exist for a couple of seconds. That service still needs to be secure for the, the three seconds it's alive and how do you add security to it? Most organizations don't even know what they have in the cloud, which gets to that, that cost runaway issue too of, you know, I, I'll ask an organization, what does your cloud footprint look like? And they're like, yeah, we don't know. We're, we're doing this, and I know we're doing that, but I have no idea what's in my cloud. And you know, when we take a look at it and use you know some of our own internal tools that work with our cloud providers, we can say, hey, this is what we see. We see you know these VPCs and these VNets and these services and these this stuff turned on and these storage arrays and these um, you know interlinks between the different networks and links between you know uh, you know physical private networks. And we'll ask them, like, oh, did you know that you're connected to this network or this virtual network in the cloud? And they're like, yeah, we have no idea what that is. I'm like, we don't have visibility into it, but we can tell you you're connected to it. And people don't understand what they're even doing in the cloud. And because of, you know, of the, the agility of the cloud, which is really the reason people go to the cloud, it's end of the day, you don't really save a lot of money by going to the cloud. You, you spread that cost out evenly over a longer period of time as opposed to the traditional you know capital de and, and depreciation and then paying maintenance on stuff. But 
what you gain by going to the cloud is the agility, which then you can you can save time and money by being more agile as opposed to the traditional capital cost. But because it's so fluid and dynamic, a lot of organizations don't even know what they have in the cloud because so many people have access to it. I can spin up a server or a service or uh, anything in the cloud with a couple strokes of a you know keyboard, and now I've got a web server with an application backend that's exposed to the internet. Before that, you know, you had to buy a server. It had to go through a procurement process. It had to go through a, a staging process. There were multiple checks and balances to allow that. So you need to have those tools that are automating those checks and balances now uh, in your cloud environment. Yeah, now it's a push button versus going through that long right. process where everybody's informed. Everybody knows what's going on when it was traditional on-premise or data center. Now it's in the cloud. I can spin up. I can have problems with shadow IT. Anybody can mm -hmm. spin something up in a cloud, and or not only infrastructure as a service, but even software as a service. I don't have to go through IT to go mm -hmm. get software now. I can just go sign up, give them my credit card, and now I've got a whole other environment that's taken my data, taken my information, and it hasn't gone through security, IT, or anything at all. So, And data, a lot of people don't realize that is data. That is data about mm -hmm. your information. You could have your board meeting. You talk about your financials. You're talking about uh, you know architecture designs. A hacker gets a hold of that data, that just that video and voice information. That's enough information for them to take that and launch a compromise. Mm -hmm. it, it, all it is about information. Attackers are looking for reconnaissance. And I don't know how many clients we've talked to and said, well, I don't need to worry because I'm in manufacturing or I'm in, I say, I'm sorry, everybody's got to worry. Not only because of ransomware, but because they get that information. You have bank accounts, right? Wire fraud. You have HR information. You have social security numbers, identity theft. So it's, it's all out. Anything that's in the cloud is now data from video, audio, and not just, you know, zeros and ones. That's amazing. And so when you ran that, your tool, it was 800 vulnerabilities. Is that like... No, so it was vulnerabilities, security misconfigurations. Okay. These were checkboxes that needed to be turned on. Some minor architecture. It wasn't a patch. It was this was low-hanging fruit. This wasn't, uh, you know, this wasn't, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, bad code that they put okay. into their applications. These were, these are 800 things that you could turn on in, in a couple of days to make your environment more secure. Like, how common is that? When... It's very common. It's incredibly common. Like when we do, you know, our cloud security posture management tool is designed to be run as a continuous real-time process, as we talked about the, the whole CICD thing. And it's designed to run in real time and look at people's environments constantly to look for misconfigurations through the whole life cycle and valid security concerns among other security enrichment that it does. But a lot of times to you know position the solution or to show people the power of it we will do assessments with the tool it's not designed to necessarily be an assessment tool but we'll do a, a point in time assessment to show like hey this is what our tool can keep you from getting to this point and every time we run it with 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 you know uh, in an organization's environment we see you know this is low-hanging fruit these these are the misconfigurations that cause that 85 to 90 per five percent of all cloud breaches we can fix those because this tool is telling you how how much more i'm curious um how much higher percentage of misconfiguration do you see in cloud versus kind of an enterprise right it seems like enterprise you kind of got to make more egregious errors mm -hmm. to show up on a vulnerability scan but like well it's know. a it's a magnitude different and i think you made this point of you know you had a traditional security engineer who was architecting a network or an application that was in a data center, you know, maybe working with the application engineers to develop the actual application itself. And now, you know, those lines are blurred and those now developers in the cloud need to be security minded. They, and they they're are, not. Right. That's, There's nothing you know, between right. them pressing right. a button right. and exposing to the internet. Right. And there's no way to in, insert that. They just right. have to they have to retrain how they think, right? If they're right. they have to be or or build the security in in the pipeline. I mean, I think this is one thing that we have to we're to, we I think we have to all stop stop looking at maybe the, these commercial clouds as a just another infrastructure environment. They're not. They're basically big IDEs, right? Integration environments from a developer perspective. That's what they are. They're all based on code. They're a code with a layer, right? A nice veneer that you know just to make it. I think you know pretty for for traditional sysadmins to look at. But 
right? The power is within the code. And when you look at that um, and you kind of start factoring out, I mean, if you take a basic premise of what a data set or what a, an environment in the cloud is, it is, it's a data center, right? In its, in its context, but they're spitting out data centers, right? Thousands of them on a per second per minute, right? Globally, that's what these commercial providers are doing. A data center build takes what? Traditionally 12, 18 months, right? Whatever it looks like. So you think about that, you were spinning out all the things that you would typically put in. So all the power coolings are kind of already done. You have to think about that. But you're standing up a data center footprint, a room. Um, you're standing up logging, monitoring, security, telemetry, all the basic networking, pipes, plumbing, everything is uh, um, uh, uh, antivirus detection if you're going to have traditional on-premise environments out there. So if you still deploy a server right in the cloud, you need to you know, be able to protect it right from different things as well. So you're doing all this, but now you're doing it with a push of a button and you're doing it within you know, 20, 30 you know, minutes total. So you have all that, think about the power. Now you put that in the power of a developer that says, I need five environments run up because I can't wait for infrastructure and security, I got to do it now because I got to deliver my code. So if you don't embed security, you know, from an outcome perspective immediately, right, all of a sudden, you know, you're right, you're putting it in the hands of, you know, somebody that not necessarily has to, or has been trained, but also I think it's an unfair burden. Why have them, why have the developer, you know, uh, assume, have to assume the security? And that's the whole point of ensuring that you put a robust kind of model in place and why security should be, you know, from the, uh, laid into the environment right from the onset because, if you're putting it in, in people's hands that want to do it, have instant gratification, right? Developers and others that need it right now, business unit owners, and you're expecting them to secure it on your behalf, right? You're, you're going to have some larger challenges. So, so think about that, right? Val the volume and the, and, the, and the speed in which these environments can be provisioned and you don't have the time and effort to go through your traditional build processes, right? And so when you think about a data center being stood up every couple of seconds, right? I think all of a sudden with all the things that go in it, I think your mindset changes quite a bit, so. That's a good point. I mean, it's all in a browser, right? That's all they have to do is just, I need a browser where, to your point, in the past, you know, businesses, they're not in the business for, of data centers, of running data centers, like, you know, the cooling, the power, the electric, you know, the uh, racks, hardware, and all that. Now, I mean, that is the reason I think is one of the drivers besides everything else that's going on is why companies are getting in the cloud is, we don't want to put the cost, the capital, the time, and everything to run a data center, much less can we even run one. I mean, how many data centers you've walked into and you've seen servers sitting on top of carpet and you've seen water sprinklers above it, and another one you got wires strapped all over and stuff, or, or if you close the, you know, the circuit breaker box, the, just the door on it, it shuts the entire data center down. We're, we just don't know how to run data centers. These companies like Amazon and Microsoft and Google can run data centers, but to David's point, you can build a data center now with the push of a button in a browser, and if you don't have the right skill sets and you know right, the right process in there, what what other additional damage are you doing? If you don't don't worry about the carpet now, don't worry about the you know, water sprinklers. Mm -hmm. Worry about pushing that button and but not pushing the right buttons or turning the screws that go alongside that. It, it's almost as simple as like, um, you know, in the past a developer couldn't push something to the internet until the firewall guy did something. Now mm -hmm. the developer can press those buttons right. and he's there. Right. Is right. it just that simple that there's just no you know, checks and balances? On well, that's that. what the oversight was. When yeah. you asked the security people, I need to expose this application, that's when they said, okay, what is the application doing? And that prompted a lot of the, you know, is this app secure? Is it exposing data that shouldn't be exposed just from a, a governance and compliance standpoint? Yeah. You, don't, you don't have that. You don't have that impending event anymore that says I need to expose an application. Let's look and see what it's doing. It's, yeah. it's you know, now we have applications that are exposed, and it's the security people saying, "Well, how do I secure it?" And yeah. that's that's yeah. that's the problem. It should be that continuous development, but the problem is, you know, it's now reversed where we're now trying to say, "How do we secure something?" While it's since it's already been released, as opposed to, I can't release something until the security folks say it's secure. It, it's kind of like the cloud is is built to work by default, right. whereas like an enterprise, you actually have to enable it, right? right? It's not, they can't get out until somebody opens it up and allows you out in the cloud. They press the button, you're out, right. and then you have to secure it. And that mechanism just... Yeah, there's a, a, a funny story that uh, worked with a... Uh, smaller organization they weren't a customer they are now but um they were doing a marketing campaign where they had uh, uh, was driving 
uh, views to a website. Um, and uh, they were tracking the views to the website as, as the success of their marketing campaign. So they said, hey, we're gonna put this website in the cloud. Um, so they you know, stood up a AWS environment, um, put their application, it was a very simple web-based application in the cloud and uh, release their, their, their marketing campaign to drive people to get more information and, and capture you know, whatever marketing information they were trying to get. And uh, it was wildly successful. They were high-fiving each other. They're like, these websites are super busy and you know, we, we, we couldn't in a million years imagine that we would get this much traffic to our website until they looked into it. And what had happened is their websites were actually hacked and malicious code was dropped in and they're basically doing crypto mining. And this went on for months. Oh my God. And attackers had taken over their application. And because of the scaling of the cloud, it, you know, infinitely, you know, in theory, scaled to where these crypto miners just kept firing off more and more web applications because they were using it for crypto mining. Whereas the organization is high fiving each other because they think that their 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 marketing campaign was so wildly successful and it's you know somewhat of a victimless crime. You know they, they didn't hack and steal information um, that that they knew of, but they were using their cloud resources, their dollars, I was gonna say. and their bills were going through the roof. Right. But they were happy about it because they thought it was traffic to their their marketing capturing website, and it really was just crypto miners. And actually, the marketing campaign was a complete disaster failure at the end of the day. Um, wow. So that's you know kind of one example of you know you have the agility of the cloud. In this case, it worked against them. You know, is that the agility of the cloud? If it was your own internal website, you would have built it with you know the capacity you, you were expecting, and once you reached that capacity, you would have been like, oh, let's take a look at why you know we're at eighty percent utilization. But in the cloud, you don't have a cap on your utilization. I mean, you can put the caps in, but if you don't, it could infinitely scale to you know you know anything beyond what you could possibly uh, imagine. So yeah. you know that's a that's a case where you know. The agility of the cloud actually worked against, well, for the hackers, against the, the company, depending on which side of the you know, side you're on. Good for the hackers, bad for the, the organization. So how are we looking at, you know, one preventative or detective controls, right? And then, you know, Tony, you've mentioned, well, then you move into more advanced, like corrective, right? Mm -hmm. So that starts maturing yeah. up the stack and you talk about knowledge and skill get sets, you know, that's one. The other area is making sure that your, you know, folks that are working in the environment start getting the head around the cloud from, traditionally we expected these assets are always going to be there not going away. You mentioned in the cloud you've got certain functions or roles that could take multiple seconds depending on when they are needed to be called upon. You know, that's considered immutable infrastructure, right? Well, that, that's the concept term, which is you should be able to wipe away your environment and then within 30 seconds bring the whole thing up, right? So getting used to that these things, these environments can, can be stateless yes. in nature, that your security concerns can go away, right, with a push and button. And, but then also rebuild it back, right? So it's almost like, you know, destroying that Lego and then look at the instruction and putting the Lego back together again, right? You know? Cattle versus pets analogy. Exactly. You know, <laughs> your data center is your pet. When it's, yes. when it's sick, yes. you bring it to the vet and you care and feed for it and you do things and you train it and it becomes part of your family. When you move stuff to the cloud, it becomes cattle and when that cow is sick, you shoot it. Not to be <laughs> blunt, but that's you know that's how you have to look at it. And you're exactly right. Is well, if you do the cloud right, you should be able to rebuild your infrastructure in literally a matter of, of hours to, to rebuild your entire infrastructure. And that infrastructure, those blueprints for that infrastructure exist. And you're just clicking a button, say cloud implement all this stuff. And that's even a point at which you can insert security. Is as these blueprints are sitting digitally but our actual blueprints of your your data center or your cloud environment is not only can you put security into the real time you can put security into scanning your blueprints so they're secure before they even get actually implemented and you're looking at the blueprints to say hey there's a security vulnerability in your blueprints no one's going to exploit it because it's literally a piece of instruction sitting on a virtual piece of paper um, but we can look at that virtual piece of paper and say, this is going to be a problem if you implement this, let's fix it right in the blueprint and change it as opposed to waiting for it to be deployed before it's a problem. And that's that whole so continuous ideally, innovation. So ideally, pausing before you turn on your first one, you know, before it becomes wildfire, which is what happens, right? right? Exactly. Uh, 
understanding what the pillars are, baking in, uh, baking in the mm-hmm. those you know security blueprints, controls, right. you know approach process. Um, how much, how much have you seen, you know, just IT right? Because we went through that too. Traditional IT, you know, engineers trying to learn the cloud and mm-hmm. get knee deep in it before they realize, you know, holy cow, there's a lot more to this than it's easy to get things working. It's hard to make sure they stay working right or, or secure them. Are you seeing that with you know uh, cloud providers too that don't really understand the security? They're just partners of these giant cloud companies helping people flip stuff on, and they may themselves not be very security aware. Yeah, and it, and it not that the cloud providers are insecure. Microsoft, Amazon, Google, but they're making the you know, They do a very very good job of securing their environment. They take security one hundred percent seriously. But at the end of the day, they're trying to make money by getting you to use more of their cloud services. Right. I mean, that's no secret. So the harder they make it, if they make you jump through a bunch of security controls to expose your own applications, yeah. it goes against them trying to make money. Now, they're stand-up organizations that, For sure. you know, that give you the security controls. And even our tools, a lot of our tools are really just using the security controls and the APIs that the cloud providers are exposing we're just using them in a way that's more consumable yeah. by the by the end user and augmenting some of the security tooling that that the cloud providers already provide so integrating with their 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 security tools and giving you consistent security across a you know a multi or hybrid cloud yeah. environment but um, you know it's against their business model to want to stop you from using more of their resources because then you know they, they they make more money but the tooling is there. The security controls are mostly there. There's always going to be the zero day. There's always going to be the the person, you know, hacking a, you know, a vulnerability in an application. Or, um, but it's it's the misconfigurations. That's that 85 to 95 percent of the the vulnerabilities out there are misconfigurations in the cloud and misconfigurations of traditional things that we've moved to the cloud. You mentioned Active Directory. Um, if you talk to our incident response team. Active Directory is is one cloud based Active Directory is one of the number one targets, and if you even go to the Solar Winds uh, attack, right. yeah. which was a supply chain attack, but at the end of the day, that attack their ultimate goal was to get to Active Directory and modify the key, so then they had access to the whole environment. Um, so not implementing something like Active Directory securely in the cloud can cause you know massive issues in, in your environment. Those controls existed in the traditional data center when you bought That's right. a bunch of servers that were running Active Directory and you had your controls around them. Now you just move it to the cloud and a click of a button, you've got Active Directory running in the cloud. Yep. It's fantastic, it's agile, it's scalable, it is an awesome solution. But you need to put those security controls around it and have just as much or more security posture around you know your Active Directory in the cloud as you do in a traditional data center. We'll use our security posture management, our, our, our Dome 9 tool, um, to do the, you know, the, the visibility and that, that real-time you know, auditing of your, of your environment. But then that tool, you know, not only can we fix the low-hanging fruit, which is the easiest opportunity, but then we'll say, hey, you're running you know, Kubernetes over here. That needs to be secured. You know, obviously, we have a product for that. You know, you have um, you know this stuff is directly exposed to the internet. This is where you need our traditional network security zero day stuff. Um, you're using a ton of lambda functions and API calls. We have an API security that all gets delivered from this platform. It's technically a separate license and product, but it's a it's a way of you know. Dome 9 is our best selling tool, even if we gave the product away for free, because it tells you where in all the points in your network, in your cloud environment, you need to buy other stuff from us. Yeah. Well, I was going to talk about, you know, kind of summarizing everything we've been talking about is, you know, it's not just posture assessment. It's not just compliance. It's it's the big picture and putting together a framework around still, you know, threat management. How do you protect your environment? Tony was talking about the blocking and tackling type stuff, and there's different solutions that you guys have with your cloud guard and everything from, you know, the container all the way to the entire infrastructure as a service or platform as a service. Then there's the vulnerability assessment. So you need to continually scan, and that's where the, you know, the posture management, the misconfiguration uh, with, with the Dome 9 cloud guard. And then there's still the 
the SIM, the security information event management, the security monitoring. You've got to watch the visibility so you can block his stuff. You can scan everything and get information, but there's that continuous eyes on glass watching to see what's going through to see is there reasons for the spikes in your traffic that's coming through. Um, monitoring your identities, monitoring your, you know, and, that, and it's important to not only just focus on the cloud, but everything that's accessing that cloud. It's still just as important to protect your endpoint because this is the interface to get into that cloud. Your laptop, your mobile device gets breached, you have an into it, you know, your attacker has an in, into it uh, pipeline right into your cloud anyway. The network, the network still has to be connected. And it's even more important from a business continuity perspective, uh, building that resiliency around because now your stuff isn't sitting in your data center next to you and you just have a local area network. You now have a complete wide area network and your users are accessing it all from home. So the components all around that cloud that has to be put into your big picture, you need a framework to manage all that, threat protection, vulnerability scanning, security monitoring, and then metrics are more important. You've got to have the data that's coming through, the dashboards, so that you know that your tools are working properly, your security controls are in place, uh, you're getting visibility on incidents that are coming through, and watching those trends and being able to analyze that. You know, how many, you know, years ago, you'd have conversations with the board about, you know, are we at risk? Well, okay, we're, we're, what industry are you in? You're in retail. Well, back then, it was what attackers were going after, government, manufacturing for intellectual property, the banks for the financial information. Retail wasn't quite a big thing yet, but of course, that got with the credit cards. But then how many retailers say, well, I just, I, I use a third-party processor, so I don't need to worry about That's that. Right. Right? Well, it's still connect your pin pad's still connected to your POS. <laughs> but that you know summarize it all is everybody's at risk because not only ransomware not only financial but there's data there in your environment that's for sale on the dark web right. and go run a digital you know digital <clears throat> risk is a new thing outside and go run a tool that can go out and search the dark web for what your information is out there for sale I'll guarantee there's something your yeah. brand your rep your mm -hmm. uh, executives all that information you have is a marketable value for an attacker that they they purchase and they use to launch an attack. Yeah. Not only a wire fraud, not only a so, you know, social security numbers, but any, anything, any indicators, they can put that enough information together, they can put enough information, they can guess your password with that. Mm -hmm. And a health record on the dark web is worth more than your social security number these days. Is that right? Yeah, and it's the, the health records are a huge, uh, uh, a huge target for, for cyber criminals. It's worth more to them, just from a pure monetary perspective, uh, on the dark web than, than even a credit card number or social security number. And from a visibility standpoint, if you do anything, your bookends are understanding the dark web, web presence and then understanding right. you know, what, what the footprint. Right. And even making that connection. I mean, uh, you know, there's, there's SOC tools that you know, monitor dark web and incidents and actually will right. apply them to your environment to say, oh, you know, there's Archon information on the dark web. I'm monitoring Archon's cloud environment. I'm going to try and correlate that information using artificial intelligence, so it's not humans having to connect the dots. Of looking at that visibility in general and trying to apply it directly to you know through our intelligence, through our tools into your environment to say, oh, this is probably how this happened because there was a campaign to go after Archon. They got information. Oh, this is where it came from. This is how we're gonna, you know, put the controls around to keep it from happening in the first place, or an ongoing type of of, of attack. I'd be curious, just kind of in closing up, what what you guys see as the biggest challenges? We rush to the cloud, um, you know, getting ahead of all this stuff. Is it just the general understanding, or you know, where where are the you know, where are we gonna look back in two years and think? You know, this was the real challenge that, that people had in either their understanding, their approach. When I think, you know, we've talked a lot about securing your cloud infrastructure and what you can do around that. And Chris has brought this up a couple times is the shift of people just coming from endpoints to get into your environment That's now. Right. And just because you've implemented a VPN, whether it's a cloud-based VPN or a kind of a traditional sort of, you know, bulky client on your endpoint type of VPN, Encryption does not equal security. Encryption right. equals privacy. And just because a channel is encrypted doesn't mean I can't do malicious things over an encrypted channel. In fact, it makes it harder to find those malicious things. Yeah. So we're having to move 
security not only closer to the server, but doing more security at the endpoint and being able to not only secure the endpoint, but be able to secure the, the, the data that's being transferred over these sort of cloud-based VPN services, the secure access edge market, uh, the SASE market that, that, that people call it, being able to provide security in, in that type of environment too. Because if you're using something like a SAS application, Office 365, um, you're using your endpoint, you're connecting to your data, but it's still sitting in Microsoft's data center. It's sitting in an Azure data center, but the only thing you're controlling is the application settings and the data. Yeah. So the only controls you have is either to use back-end APIs into Office 365, which we can provide threat prevention tools that way, or securing the endpoint or being able to secure that that VPN transit and being able to look at that information. So those yeah. are kind of the three the places. The shift to the endpoint security right. has, has been something that's caught a lot of people right. off. And putting security and into that And why that's needed, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, my lens is going to come from uh, from a, from a business and, and governance perspective, right? You know, governance sounds totalitarian, overarching, but it's really around can, can you know providing minimal guidance but maximum adoption, right? To governance to ensure that you still have your your agility. It's really ensuring that you know both most of the clouds have adoption frameworks. Um, but going back and looking at that as a guidepost and saying, did I take out these particular areas around that? addressing your cultural norms and what they are today and what they need to be tomorrow, right? It's a massive cultural adoption and work methods improvement. Looking at your change management processes, and again, by not impacting your continuous in in integration, but ensuring that security is kind of embedded. So it's really making sure that you're looking through a much, you've got a lot, and then the financial operations, right? So the cloud, the business center, the business office, or the cloud business office concept of financial ops, you know, while on the surface it doesn't sound like it's a security, it is, going back to runaway costs. So having a good understanding of your day-to-day, -day, where is the money going, where you're using it, is actually adding business value. So, Well, and how hard is it to get approval on incremental security when your data center costs have, have gone out of control, right? Exactly. So again, so not technical, but you have to look at it from both a business lens, right, and a, and a, a governance lens. Chris? Yeah, and it's, you know, it's amazing because, what, eight years ago, I was at a particular conference out in Arlington talking about this very same topic. Ah, that's right. <laughs> cloudy with a chance of meatballs. And here we are eight years you know, forward, and we're still talking about it. So yeah. it's, it's a testament that it's, it's hard, it's challenging. You know, a lot of progress has been made to the cloud. But going back to why we're talking here today is because COVID has accelerated that yes, so fast. That's right. It's not only accelerated the movement out of your on-prem data centers into the cloud, because look at how many companies are addressing, you know, questioning, do we need a corporate office anymore? That's right. So it's not only moving, you're pushing your data out in the cloud, it's pushing your users at home. Yeah. So you've got a challenge of not only securing the cloud, but those users right. getting securely from their home using lockdown, at, you know, secure assets. Are they using their home machine? Are they using, you know, mm -hmm. everybody, we've retro back to letting people use their home machine with no security control. That's right. Yep. So there's your for, first point of indicator. So the point is, that hopefully understand out of the, coming out of this webinar is to understand you got to look at all layers, take a risk based approach, and make sure you know you have visibility into what's going and on. And use security as an enabling tool to do that kind of stuff, yeah. to be able to allow your home users to be able to use their own personal laptops or cell phones to access corporate data. You don't want to. You can easily say no and make right. it secure, but you need to be able to say yes and, and use security as an enabling yeah. technology. Yeah. And also consume your security technology the same way you're securing your IT resources and secure and consuming it as a service and no longer buying a software or piece of hardware that you amortize over you know four or five years is actually consuming security as a service so you get continuous updates of those or continuous updates of those solutions and it fits into your financial model from a, a, an acquisition standpoint too. Yeah, and you have a whole other webinar just talking about all the cloud security, you know, the cloud, the security controls are moving to the cloud as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. And we talk, touch on a little bit, but yeah, definitely all good points. Well, I think this is a good, good stopping point. We've had a lot of good stuff today. Tony, I want to thank you for coming in Anytime. and walking through this in, in detail. We're going to have some, some follow-ups on, you know, uh, we're using your tool for free security scans that are leading into complex, you know, um, projects and in some cases, simple ones afterwards. So, we appreciate you know you you lending that to us, um, 
and I think we'll we'll continue having discussions about you know what are the components. It's easy to go to the cloud, hard to do it the right way, and that's I think that's the big lesson, right? Um, so we'll continue talking about. But I want to thank everybody for sitting in today, and I think that's a wrap. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Now we'll be moving on to the Q&A session. We have a handful of questions that our panelists, Tony and Chris, are going to answer for you. If you haven't already, please feel free to submit any questions to our chat. The questions will remain anonymous. With that being said, I will now open the floor to our panelists. It's Chris Hinke again, and joining me in the Q&A is Tony Sabai. Uh, Tony, our first question that came in is, how long does it take for a cloud security scan and how intrusive is it? So the initial scan of doing security posture management, depending on the size of the cloud environment, um, really in max could really only take, uh, you know, a couple of hours to really get all the information. Um, and it's very non-obtrusive to the environment. It's really using exposed APIs from the cloud providers on the back end to read information and then do the assessment. So it has no impact on the running of the organization's cloud environment. So really just a couple of hours and, and no real impact to the organization from a performance standpoint. Awesome, thanks, Tony. And the next question we had is, what is the difference between a vulnerability scan and a cloud security scan? Do I need both? So I'll start with that uh, response is, so a vulnerability scan, you can look at it from an infrastructure as well as an application vulnerability scan. And where a cloud security scan is essentially uh, scanning the perimeter, the configurations, looking at different uh, uh, options that need to be set up from key transfers to key encryption. Where I still believe that the vulnerability scan is critical because there's other things on the virtual server that you want to be scanning uh, for compatibility, you know, for operating system or application type de detail, and then especially on that application, making sure that there's good coding processes throughout that that uh, can expose you to like SQL injection or man-in-the-middle type attacks or, or databases. Anything else to add on that, Tony? No, I. I... I think you hit it right on the head of you know vulnerability scans again looking for specific vulnerabilities in some of the cloud scans you know really just looking at the the overall architecture of your cloud and, and really understanding it great yep so definitely some differences there and you do want to keep all just doing one cloud security scan is not enough you got to keep your vulnerability uh, uh, management process in tune along with what you have been doing on your on-premise as well Next question we had is, uh, will the cloud security detect problems immediately or do you have to scan to find issues? Uh, Tony? Yeah, so the issues that a, you know, a cloud security scan uh, will, will find are immediate. Um, they are, you know, they will, they will find issues immediately. They will be um, you, notified immediately, even if the scan takes a couple of hours, the, the the vulnerabilities or issues that are found in the cloud security scan will, will come up in real time from an assessment standpoint. Um, and then from a continuous assessment standpoint of, you know, having this type of tool running 100% of the time monitoring your environment, the, the alerts are immediate, you know, as, as, as fast as, you know, the little bit of information that needs to happen travels, you know, around the internet, you know, so it's, it's, it's you know within you know a second of a vulnerability existing uh, that that vulnerability or that issue is notified, and then you can do different remediation steps of automatic remediation or or manual remediation uh, if if you choose to turn that part of the the tool on from a remediation standpoint. Awesome, thanks, Tony. Our next question is, can cloud security posture management help with compliance? So absolutely. Uh, it first starts off with just the fact that you're performing cloud security posture management is that form of risk assessment, uh, testing your environment, that checks a box in terms of, you know, are you performing that on a regular basis, as well as using, you know, Checkpoint's Cloud Guard, where you can, as Tony was indicating, you can hook into the environment to the tenant, and you can run scans based upon various levels of compliance requirements. You can perform and get a HIPAA report, PCI, all aligning to those requirements 
uh, with the findings and then re recommendations that come out of it. So absolutely across the board, uh, just the activity of doing it as well as the detail on where, uh, you know, compliance requirements around network security, segmentation, uh, vulnerability scanning, uh, quite a few areas that it knocks out. Uh, next question we had was, Tony, what are, the, what are the, some type of unique threats in the cloud that a security posture management can address? So really some of the, you know, unique threats that we see in the cloud, um, you know, and we talked about this, you know, earlier, you know, some of the low hanging fruit is really looking at, you know, is your data at rest encrypted? Um, really easy to, you know, to look for and continuously monitor. Um, so it, it, it's kind of unique, you know, from a, from a cloud perspective. Uh, you, what else is sort of a unique security concern in the cloud is really who has access to your information and being able to help enforce, you know, what, what's called the least, least privilege model or, you know, zero trust model of making sure that you don't have extra exposed access to your entire cloud environment or specific applications. And our tool can help enforce that uh, least privileged access uh, concept uh, within your cloud environment. So you're not overexposing who has access, uh, you know, even internally within your organization uh, to really help uh, enforce that that zero trust, least privilege concept of access in the cloud. Great, thanks, Tony. And then our next question is really kind of a loaded one. It's like, which cloud provider is more secure? <laughs> And that one, you know, you've got Microsoft Azure, you've got uh, Google Cloud Platform, and you have Amazon Web Services. Our point of view is that all of them have the security controls. They have, you know, they, they have departments and expertise. And, and the main reason is if they don't, they're out of business, right? So if they have a breach or if they don't have the right tools in place. The key point on this is when you talk about a cloud provider and their security is they will provide, as we talked throughout our uh, conversations earlier with the team, is they will provide those. It's really up to you, the administrator, as the customer, to make sure you're configuring, that you're leveraging them, everything. And as Microsoft has their you know, compliance center and their uh, information protection portals, as well as uh, Amazon has their security hub and uh, various uh, tool stacks and stuff. Again, it's all on how you use them, how you configure them, and how you monitor and keep your eyes on glass. Anything else to add to that, Tony? No, I, I, I think you hit it right on the head of, you know, all, all the major cloud providers have just fantastic security programs in place, but, and they give you a lot of tools to use. It's, it's how you use those tools and how you use them effectively, which really gives you your, you know, your security stance within the public cloud. Uh, and it's 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 the use of those tools that that make the cloud secure, and the use of the the uh, methodologies that uh, you know people like Archon can can help you with uh, uh, implementing those in in the cloud environments, as, as well as bringing in additional partners like Checkpoint mm -hmm. and adding layers around that, because there's you know just doing one thing is never enough. As we all know in the security space, it's all depth and in, in layers and stuff, and so. Well, that was the last question that we had come in. I don't, Danny, do we have any other questions or are we uh, all set? And that being said, uh, that concludes the end of our webinar. We'd like to thank you all for taking the time out of your day to join us. If you'd like to refer back to this webinar at a later time, it will be available to view on our YouTube channel as well as our website. Please also follow us on all of our social media channels for information on future webinars. Stay safe and have a great day. Thank you.